All right. Um, I have the pleasure of interviewing the VC panel today. Um, we have Dana Settle, the co-founder and managing partner of Greycroft. We have Wesley, who uh, just launched Fund One last year for FPV Ventures. Sarah Kunst from Clio Capital and John Ruffalo from uh, Mavericks Private Equity. We're talking about VC market disruption and what's different today um, than previous cycles. And I thought I'd kick it off by uh, asking you, Sarah, just where are we right now and kind of how do you characterize what's going on today? Well, much like the San Bernardino Mountains, we are like buried in 10 feet of snow and it's not looking good. <laughs> I personally think it's going to get full Donner Party before it gets better. Um, which, side <laughs> note, if you've never read the Donner Party Wikipedia, do it. You will have nightmares. It is horrific. <laughs> but um, the reality is that, you know, nothing right now in the global macro is working particularly well and tech separately is like deeply extra impacted because we were the furthest thing up a couple years ago and now we are starting to be the furthest thing down. Um, and even when you look at that, you know, the public companies, the P ratios are still super, super high. Um, even though these companies are down 70, 80% off their low, off of their, their COVID highs. And so, you know, I could not be more bearish. Uh, I go on TV a lot to talk about this and the president at Fox Business, not Fox News, Fox Business was like, I like her, she predicts doom with a smile. So I am here <laughs> smiling and telling you that everything is terrible. Um, John, you've been doing this business for a long time. Yes. What, what do you have to add to that? I've never been so excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually, uh, 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 largely pulled out of the market between t uh, 2019 and 2022, largely because of the massive dislocation of the intrinsic values of companies based on what the external uh, market was doing. And, um, you know, and you see the massive uh, 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 imbalance of the supply and demand of capital. So uh, last couple of years was a time of, it was very, very difficult basically pulling out of the market and watching. And uh, right now, I would say to you, uh, the bid-ask spreads are not quite aligned yet and kind of what just Sarah was saying. You know, there there is lots of shakiness going on, but, but frankly, this is the time when you make real money, when the folks who perhaps overextended themselves and are terrified, uh, as I'm holding the door, as they're running out, I'm trying to walk back in and finding the really great companies that are looking for long-term sustainable investors to build a real long-term business. So that's why I'm very excited. And I think the second half of 2013, the bid-ask spreads are probably going to get as close as, uh, as, as, as you might expect in order to execute uh, some, some, some uh, interesting uh, deals. Dana, you started Greycroft before the Great Recession, um, and so you've sort of been through this uh, deeply before. Um, what are you seeing today as far as places to deploy capital, and how are you thinking about the early stages versus the growth stages? Uh, how are you guys doing it at Greycroft? Yeah, I mean, I think, like John, I mean, I, I feel the same way in a lot of ways. I literally feel like I wake up every morning and have to sort of pinch myself because I think, you know, it is during these times where everybody's sort of running, to, you know, for the hills and, oh my gosh, the, you know, the sky is falling, that um, there are the best investment opportunities. Because it really is when you see founders just dig in and have, you know, just a tremendous amount of grit and make those tough decisions that, you know, um, Adam and Dick were talking about earlier. And you really see what it takes to, to build a company and, and not in a, you know, during a hype cycle where capital is essentially free. So um, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of coupled with, it, you know, I'll, I'll, this is going to sound like the most o over uh, discussed thing right now, but you know, the wave uh, behind what's happening with AI is truly um, uh, just game changing. And I think in a way that we haven't even begun to uh, comprehend. And John and I were talking about this a little bit uh, backstage before coming on. Um, you know, I started out in the cellular industry um, when really the, you know, mobile phones were first being built and, and networks around the world. And, you know, my first job out of college was working in India, bidding on cellular spectrum to build out networks there when nobody even, you know, like very few people actually had landline telephones. And when you think about the impact that had, it was so tremendous just having connectivity. And where we are right now in AI sort of feels like we're at a similar massive inflection point in what is possible in, you know, with technology. 
Wesley, I'm going to come to you next. Um, you've been an investor for quite some time. You've invested in some of the most recognizable companies in tech through your time at GV and Felicis. Where are you focused, and, and what do you think the opportunities look like today? Boy, I'm, I'm just looking for the next Google, right? <laughs> like, I hate to say this. Look, I started my career, uh, you know, I graduated from MIT in 2000, and I remember starting my career there, and I thought I was being very smart and doing a computer science degree. Everybody was getting paid these, like, you know, big-ass six-figure salaries when I was in school, and then I graduated. Dot-com crash, right? I'm like, oh, my goodness, I could not have timed this any worse. And I went to this tiny company, and it was called Google, and it happened to have, you know, 100 people there or so, and they said, we can't make, we don't know how to make money. You're on the monetization team. I'm like, what's that? And they're like, you figure it out. <laughs> We have to make payroll. Google survived the dot-com crash. It reopened the IPO market. I still remember we were like we'd had these white vans that we were going to like go pick up Aeron chairs for you know forty bucks a piece when they were two thousand dollars because all these startups were failing. Like there was so much misbehavior when money was cheap and money was free that you know a lot of folks in this business and I'm not going to name names or thing or anything were doing no diligence deals at outrageously high prices at impossible multiples and giving founders everything they asked for and then some. Those deals are going to get wiped out. You know if you're an LP, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But, you know, one of those things is that companies like Google come out from these disasters, right? They're the ones that can hire engineers for a fraction of the price, that, can, that have a mission-driven founder, that are creating things that make so much money because it's something people want in their product-led growth companies. Those are the ones that retain value and become these outrageous returns. I still remember being told by, you know, some of our board members that, like, look, you guys can't screw this up. This is the only company that can return Kleiner Fund 7, and then some, and it wound up being Kleiner's best return turning fund. So it's one of those things where I expect to find the next uh, Google out of this out of this disaster and then the the uh, the uh, the the winners will become very very obvious. I still remember going go, uh, and looking for a job in Silicon Valley in 2000 going like, "Well, like, you know, everybody's laying off, offers are being rescinded." I'm watching I remember going through three roommates when I was out there because like their dot com company doing whatever was was laying people off and they'd have to go move in with the parents in Ohio. And I'm like at this tiny company going, "We're not paying me very much, but boy, did it work out." And those companies are going to be the ones that thrive in this time and I can't wait to find them along with some of my colleagues on the stage. Sarah, you're um, investing at the pre-seed and seed stage predominantly. Or do you think early stage uh, opportunities are sort of insulated from what we're talking about here today? Or what are you seeing there? So pre-seed valuations never got super high. Um, pre-seed is a really hard game to play as an institutional because you're diligencing kind of nothing. Um, and you know, so as these funds grew, Capital's cheap, the funds get bigger. As the funds get bigger, it gets harder and harder to justify making a million dollar investment in a company that's going to need you like every second of the day because it's just a couple founders around a coffee table. Um, and then, you know, the ability for that to return the fund is incredibly low, especially if you mainly do early stage. And so you know, those valuations, yeah, they got up to like 10 million, but they never got up to the heights that that the later stage companies were getting to. What you would see were a lot of companies that would just go do a seed. So they wouldn't do a friends and family, really. They wouldn't do, you know, they'd come to their friends and family and say, here's an uncapped note with a 5% discount. It's like, okay, buddy, like, I don't know if that's too friendly. And so, you know, there were a lot of people who skipped that and they're probably in a tough space. Pre-seed, I think we're going to see sort of a Cambrian explosion of company building because because more than 70,000 people have been laid off of tech. Like so many people, the roommates you're going through, right? Like they are in this position where they know enough to be dangerous. They know what they were working on internally, what wasn't working. You know, they know numbers from these big companies. They have a pet project that in 21 would have been greenlit and they would have built it internally. And now they're like, should we go build it? And so I think that it's going to be an amazing time to do pre-seed investing. I think you're gonna see a ton of strength come out of accelerators, the YCs and tech stars of the world, because there are a bunch of people who were kind of golden handcuffed into these decacorn companies or these massive, you know, public tech companies who now are sitting there and they're not broke. They were making, you know, well in the six figures, but they're like, oh, I have to go do something else and I can't just go from, you know, Google to Meta anymore. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the portfolio companies that you guys all have and kind of what they're going through. Um, the markets are, have obviously been tough for them. A lot of companies raise at high valuations. Starting with you, Dana, what are you doing with your portfolio? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, I, I, um, it, it's funny. I've been working closely with one of our companies that you know um, had a really significant round that was about to close. And then the fund, it was a newer fund, sort of pulled out at the last minute. 
and it was, you know, $50 million round. And, and the company, um, really, I mean, it's like you're in shock. Like they were, it was, you know, sort of right at the finish line and they had all these plans. And, and so we just had to completely retrench and, uh, working really closely with another, uh, VC on it. And, and, um, it, it's amazing just seeing the team, how quickly they just dug in, prioritized, you know, okay, this is where we have to focus. This is where we can't just, and, and really, you know, cut huge amounts of cost out of the business, but also just really refocus the business. And I think now coming out on the other side of that, where, you know, we, we did an inside round, cleaned, cleaned things up, the company's in amazing shape, but I actually think had they closed that round, um, there's a chance that the company like wouldn't have made it. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting when you think about how clarifying it is to not have access to that, you know, sort of free capital or super cheap capital because it, it just perpetuates bad behavior. And I think, and, and then you sort of do see the teams that are really willing to like dig in, grind it out, figure out what you need to do. And so that's, I mean, I find that super gratifying. I think that's probably a lot of why all of us do this, this job is to really be working closely hand in hand with the teams that we're backing. And so, you know, and, and you know, I'm, that's one of many, right? Like, and, and I'm sure that there will be many more, but it is, you know, I think it's the times like that where you see what it really takes to go through that. Cause it's hard. It's, and you know, and it's funny at the end of it, the team, you know, is like, geez, this has actually been the best few months, you know, I've had in, in a long time. Wesley, I know we talked about this a little bit too. What do you think? Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. I still remember this lunch I had, uh, with Charlie Munger, and you know, we were talking about the, um, the, the this impending sort of economic crisis that was coming up, and he kind of looks at me and he goes, "Wesley, you know, when times are tough and when things go things go south, the marginal doesn't get funded. Stay out of the marginal things." I still remember, you know, him saying that, and I sort of look at how I invest, right, in companies that you know uh, they make money the old-fashioned way by building products that people care about, or they're doing drug discovery or life sciences where they're creating a cure for cancer, and if that cure gets discovered and goes through clinical trials, it's worth ten billion dollars. And so, you know, uh, I've I've been fortunate enough in my investing career over 15 years, having survived dot com, uh, the dot-com crash and then the 08 financial crisis. I started my career being one of the original sort of starting partners at Google Ventures in 2009 to be focused on things that were not marginal, right? That made money the old-fashioned way. Like, I stayed out of scooters. I stayed out of, like, 15-minute grocery delivery. Like, if a lot of people are chasing it, in, you know, there's a big hype over it, then, you know, might be marginal, right? I stayed out of crypto. And it's one of those things where I've been fortunate enough to be working with portfolio companies that made money the old-fashioned way and that we're always capital efficient. And this just goes back to some of the challenges you're talking about. The late-stage investing market has, for the most part, shut down, right? Like, deal flow on B rounds are, like, down 70% in terms of what I've seen. C rounds and D rounds are down 85 90%, right? And so if you don't have access to capital, given that, you know, people aren't deploying, then you either have to get profitable very quickly and have a business model that's capital efficient, or you're screwed, and we're shutting the doors down, right? And, you know, in, in some cases, like what Dana was able to go through, we got that fixed and the company got the clarifying moment they need to either pivot or to go focus, you know, their business on what makes money. But, you know, for some that can't, you know, they're done. I watched all this happen in 2000 when, when, you know, again, my neighbors were packing up their cars. And so the effort that I'm spending time now that I've always spent over my last 15 years, even when things were crazy, were to go focus on those companies that no one considered marginal, that had very capital efficient structures and were building things that people wanted and made money the old fashioned way. And, you know, if you can get profitable, you have infinite runway. Google became profitable very, very quickly. They reopened the IPO market and we never had to worry about raising another round. The only way, one round, which was the Series A. And I always think back to that, those days about, you know, what happens when things are tight, having lived through it. I know it can be tough to be put on the spot to make any sort of predictions, but I'm going to try you, John, here. You know, you've seen this several times before. Mm -hmm. um, where are we in terms of the capital market cycle? Where do you, When are companies going to be able to go raise rounds at the valuations that they were expecting? Is that a decade away? Is that around the corner? How, sh how should we be thinking about that? Well, the, the way that I think about it is that the anomaly was the last few years. So that was largely wishful thinking, and it was largely predicated on the, the uh, cheap capital really driven by the, the financial crisis. So unless we do that stupidity again for that long, I think that 
money has always been money. The valuations have never changed, only in people's mind. Because if you're doing just exactly what Wesley said, if you're out there looking to generate money from a business, which is what we're trying to invest in, there is no difference in the intrinsic value of a valuation today versus you know, 20 years ago. Yet in people's mind, they created this fiction. So it's the great entrepreneurs who are realizing, you know what? Uh, and by the way, you know, you started to see the rise of this fiction around 2015 is when I started to get very, very nervous. And then by 2017, you can clearly see it. And one of the reasons why I left uh, uh, the previous fund that I found at Omer's Ventures was that I thought the world was going to implode in the second half of 2020 when largely the capital uh, and uh, was was going to start to, to dry up and interest rates were again going to rise. Now, I didn't pre predict the COVID, but it was very, very predictable. So the very good uh, entrepreneurs are going to be those who are looking at creating a business with positive unit economics and, and also realize that, that they're in this for the long haul and not for the, for the quick dollar. So I think the faster that they get behind the recency bias of the last three years in particular, those entrepreneurs are going to say, you know what, that was a fiction. Let me make sure that the next capital I get will achieve positive unit economics. And I'm, and I'm there to build a big business. But you're going through the ashes of a lot of noise, and those businesses should get washed out. The good employees are going to go and, and hopefully come to the great businesses that are surviving. So, so I would say right now is a great time to be building your business. Mm -hmm. Ignore the rockiness because... Uh, who cares and and align yourself with great pools of capital who are there economically aligned with you all the way through yeah especially I think at this sort of at the growth stage I think that there are going to be incredible opportunities over the next you know 12 24 36 months because so much capital has pulled out of that market and you know some of it temporarily but some of it permanently i mean a lot of it permanently has gone back to the public markets or you know other places that it came from um, and uh, and so i mean we have like a target list of companies that we just think are amazing companies that you know we we believe in and where we're, we're not investors and we're just going to continue to develop those relationships and find opportunities to you know back those winners and i think the you know i mean the lps that are really brave enough to kind of lean in at this stage and and not be concerned about the denominator effect or other things that are somewhat mythical um you know i think that's where there are going to be just incredible opportunities because it you know it takes some time for things to reset and for you know founders to sort of recognize that this is a you know it's a, a permanent change it's not a temporary blip but i think we're getting there uh we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about fundraising because how could we not um Dana, I can't miss the opportunity to to press you on that. You just called the, denom the denominator effect mythical. <laughs> Could you tell us more about what you mean? <laughs> we should really ask John because he's the expert. <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, I think this idea that you know when the when the public markets capitulate, which they they did. I mean, they, that happens fast and it's it's very visible and it's liquid and everybody knows what those valuations are. In the private markets, obviously, we're much more opaque, and valuations are subjective, and you know, at manager's discretion, and you know, lots of things that make it really difficult to know what those the sort of underlying values are of all of our you know of our assets. And for many reasons, people don't necessarily mark things, don't want to mark things down, and there's a lot of incentives that aren't lined up that that you know sort of cause that. And I'm going to pass it over to John. Yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have my LPs here who are outstanding, and <laughs> they will tell you out here, I have CAT and, and BCI folks here, the, the denominator effect is largely a mythical beast that was manufactured largely to kindly say, no, I don't want to invest in you. Uh, liquidity, tightness of liquidity is a very different issue, especially if you're a pension fund and you have to pay out you know the the monthly pension checks and your title and liquidity that is that is quite real and so you know in a time like this the very smart lps know who's cooking the books 
from a GP perspective. And you know, the, the view that I strongly have is be conservative in your valuations. When you do have an exit, always have a little bit of room that to show, you know, an extra 10%, just to show that you've you've left that room on there and have the 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 conservativeness of your valuations when the public markets come down like they have right now and you have the private markets uh, uh, still valued at these crazy things again it's a fiction and when 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 I see uh, public markets going down on average 30 percent and yet private equity is going up 15 percent it's like come on like we we all know so, and, and what people don't know is the very good uh, uh, pension funds, as an example, they have ranges. They don't look at short-term volatility. Uh, they look at long-term volatility and asset allocation. So when you have these fluctuations, there are very smart folks in there that say, yeah, I get it. I see we're technically offside on our denominator effect, but it will fix itself out. So everybody calm down and don't panic. And that's why I just say good LPs don't really care about it. Yeah, I, 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 I had the either good fortune or misfortune, I can't figure it out right now, <laughs> but uh, of raising last year, right? When, you know, I still remember our first LP meeting. We took two days before uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, and I, th I threw a chair out the window afterwards and said, I don't think this is going to happen. And we did wind up raising our fund. We had some really great LPs. And every as I was going through this process, everybody was really worried about how we were going to value our companies because a lot of their existing investors, and we have lots of blue chip endowments and foundations, were keeping those those numbers really, really high because no, no, there was no transaction, there was no round being raised, nobody knew how bad it was going to get, nobody knew how shut down the market was going to get, and so all these folks were keeping their marks, you know, at, at this at this ridiculous level, which was the last round price that was done two years ago when money was free and when people were a little slightly crazy. And so, I, you know, we, we're very careful about thinking about how to handle this, but like, it's one of those things where I think we're, we have still yet to see the damage to come. Yeah, and look, some of it's real, right? There are state pensions, there are endowments that, you know, they have bylaws that say you cannot go over X percentage of an allocation. And is it fake to some extent? Yes. Are they going to sacrifice their job to prove that? <laughs> no, right? Can they get the final, you know, okay to go write that check? If you're Cambridge, are you able to go allocate on behalf of, you know, your, your OCIO clients when they tell you there's a hard cap on something? Probably not. And so, yes, right, to some extent, thank Fidelity because they do what nobody else, you know, really wants to, which is they just bite the bullet, they do the write downs, and then life goes on. And you're like, hey, Stripe's still a good company. It's just not, you know, what we thought it was. And so to some extent, I think that there is an equilibrium to be found um, that's really hard for, for VCs to do, especially the ones who, you know, were all in on the froth and now the froth makes them look not so good. Um, so it is a hard balance, but the reality is there's certainly less money going, especially to emerging managers, you know, especially to smaller managers than there was, you know, even a couple years ago. Nick, I would just add on one thing. So I closed with my partners at Mavericks Private Equity, our fund, in April of 2021, which, you know, just like you, we, we, we sort of got, uh, it was, we were trying to time this. But uh, during COVID, the issue wasn't the denominator effect. The issue was, is the world melting down? And, you know, none of us knew, so we were really starting our closing during COVID. COVID. And it got delayed by virtue of that. And once we got through on the other side of COVID, uh, I was grateful for, for our LPs just to, to, to hold off. So they were looking at the long term. And in fact, the last thing I would just say, and for some of you know, just as we got through COVID, I was run over cycling uh, by a tractor trailer, which uh, landed me in this, and the LPs, and while I was convalescing in hospital for four months, still waited and and waited for me to get out of hospital so that we can close the fund. So again, uh, you know, great investors will have this flexibility, and if they've if they've decided to 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 back you, they're going to be there. Uh, I just have to take the opportunity to say, if you have a chance, I would highly recommend going and finding John's story. Um, 
I had a chance to read it over the weekend, and it is just the most moving thing I've read in a long time. You've, I, we're lucky to have you here, and I'm, I'm grateful to have the honor yeah. of even interviewing you today. I'm actually glad to be anywhere at this point <laughs> yeah. because it was very touch and go for uh, for uh, yeah. for uh, for a while there. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the sort of advice for people. I think I want to come back and sort of wrap things up by by having everybody do the same, starting with you, Sarah. Um, what advice would you, what are you doing today, and what advice would you give to GPs who are thinking about fundraising? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're thinking about fundraising and you don't have to, honestly, don't. Um, my joke is that I'll send you my wire instructions, but that is mu that's as much of an LP meeting as you can get from me right now. And, you know, I'm not in market. I don't have to be in market. And the reality is that, like, I can spend my time. I was running a startup before this, and then I started the fund in 2018. This is the first time since, like, 2016 I can just invest. And putting that energy into the companies, helping the companies, finding great deals, especially great price deals in this environment, Environment is going to give me the marks that make that next conversation a lot easier. So I send out my investor newsletters. I love saying hi to people, but going deep into diligence with people who just don't have the dry powder is a waste of time. Wesley? Oh, this is, I think, the best time to fundraise, having just been through it, right? <laughs> like, you figure out who the right, amazing, blue-chip, long-term investors who understand that this is the best time to be deploying capital in some of the best managers. Now, if you're a mediocre manager with no track record and you haven't been able to figure out what your edge is in this business and you're like, oh, I just I finished Facebook, I've never done this business, I'm hoping to raise a $50 million fund, don't do that, right? This is, you know, this is where, where the marginal gets washed away in some sense, and no offense to you guys um, who want to do that. But, you know, if you, are, if, you, if you know your edge, you really understand wh why you're in this business, you practice the art really well, this is the best time to have a fund because, again, a lot of folks are pulling out, and it's that whole quote with Warren Buffett about there being blood on the street. I mean, this is a great time for you to be deploying capital because the best companies become obvious. The best investors and LPs become obvious now because they stick with you. They believe in the long-term vision of your success, and they're there to back you. So, you know, I think this is a wonderful time to, to, to you know, fundraise, not word, but, like, build those relationships and truly understand what differentiates, like, you know, the tourists who are in this business from the ones that will stick with you for life. Dana? Quickly, yeah. you got it. First, thanks to Upfront for having us all up here. Um, and uh, I'm excited to be investing with all of you. Um, and um, find the next Google. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you. It was an honor. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rich.